Hi, welcome to part two of the Mims Butterworth Show in Journeys with Jeff. We uh, were going to pick up from last time when Mims was talking to us about the White House. We're going to just digress a little bit to start the show so you won't get confused. You are talking about a little bit clarification on National Socialism, the way it looked in 1938 Germany. And then we'll pick up with the rest of the Mims's journey and uh, hope that you en en enjoy the rest of the story. And away we go. National socialism. Oh yeah. Does that does that mean that did they have the like did the Ger German government provide health care, universal health care, and daycare and? Uh, and there was some of that, and the, the reason they, uh, of course, I haven't looked this up, but uh, they uh, nationalism. You understand was making Germany uber alles, you know, top dog, and it's the best military in the world. Um, but, uh, and so nationalism is understandable. The socialism, well, there was a, a large socialist group before Hitler came in. And so uh, he was willing, he adopted that as a way of uh, talking about socialism for Germans, Aryans, not the whole German uh, people. A certain group were uh, going to be able to uh, take advantage of what the uh, what they were giving to the underclass, and and that meant that uh, they those workers and laborers thought they were pretty good. They were top dog. Is that another parallel that you see yes. going on with this? Yes, I do. With the currently in the United right. States. Right. For whatever happens to them and the long run is another matter. Well, tell us, uh, Mim, you said that you were at the White House, Eleanor uh, Roosevelt. Did you, did you meet her? Uh, not only that, uh, our trip back from that peace, that uh, uh, youth congress, we were offered a ride by some labor people from New London who were going right to where we needed to go. And they said, we'll give you a ride. There were three of us. And they had a big, uh, big car, touring car or something. But I didn't say, if you don't mind, we have to go in t uh, to the White House to talk to Eleanor Roosevelt about the end of this, because they'd been part of the planning group. Mind, you can imagine, <laughs> who was going to mind going to the White, White House and meeting Eleanor Roosevelt. So we went, of course, on that basis. And while, while I was there, she poured tea for us all. Can you imagine a 20-year-old, a 22-year-old, or 21-year-old person being poured tea by Eleanor Roosevelt? Well, that was a wonderful moment. What was it about her that impressed you the most? Well, she was so gracious and so uh, equally gracious to everybody. You know, I mean, we were not just outsiders. We were outsiders that she was just as nice to as everybody else. I met her one other time well, out in Kent. She came later on to the a League of Women Voters in the little town of Kent that had about 2,000 people in it. And there she came and talked to us as if we were like this. And she was a wonderful woman. Can you Im imagine uh, the Secretary of Defense or the Secretary of uh, the Treasury, wives allowing 
of young people, whoever they were, to come and stay overnight in their house, and in the White House, she did. Can you imagine that happening today? So she opened up the house to... And these were uh, mainly, probably, minority people who couldn't find a hotel room because they wouldn't uh, rent out a hotel room to them. It, uh, it's a very different time. That really says a lot about her. Well, the 19... And about today. Yeah, well, 1950s, moving ahead a little bit. Uh, you were in the Connecticut legislation? Yeah. Uh, 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 legis the legislation, the districting? Redistricting. Yeah, you were in that? Uh... In the 50s. There was uh, the League of Women Voters again uh, had a case. We had moved in from Little Kent to West Hartford. And we lost political power, according to the League, because in Kent, we had, Kent had two representatives. West Hartford had two representatives. And they hadn't reapportioned re uh, that for, since 1818. And so, uh, then when they came to us and said, you know, you would be one of the 10 uh, people that would you be willing to join uh, this group to challenge both parties for redistricting, re, uh, uh, re, uh, redistricting. So we said, yes, we would. And so there is a there was a case of Butterworth because we begin with a B, uh, Butterworth versus Dempsey et al. Butterworth et al. versus Dempsey et al., which meant Dempsey plus the Secretary of State who was Ella Grasso at the time. So in a sense, uh, we were suing. Ella Grasso, but not for money, but for change in the re. How did that turn out? We won. It went to uh, the Supreme Court. It was merged with others. So it's a Supreme Court case. And uh, so it's uh, Baker versus, oh, I forget, uh, but it's part of that. And so we won, and so they had the first uh, constitutional convention in Connecticut since 1818. And both sides said it was the best political experience. They had both Republicans and Democrats working together to build, to uh, form a new a constitution, and so that was it worked out very well. You almost have felt like you're really participating in the democratic process. Definitely making a difference. Yeah. Well, the reason that the the league and we did that is because the cities had lost the their power. It was one man, one vote, and so uh, they. We felt they weren't, cities weren't able to solve their problems in the legislature. It was the farmers in the little towns that their problems were taken care of. But unless you have political power, you, can, you can't solve your problems. Women have learned that too, by the way. I used to take my class down to Washington small class, senior, and it depended on uh, to Washington in the spring, and we would have about three different issues that we wanted to pursue by talking to different uh, legislators or people there. And often we had somebody in the class who had been to law school with Wizard White, for instance, the 
Supreme Court person, or uh, and that, or uh, Kassenbach. Yes, he was the Attorney General. Yeah, Kassenbach. right. And what? what the, how did you? Uh, did you well, the we do. You, do you know? Oh, you probably know uh, the Ritters, George Ritter. Yes, from the Hartford. Yes, Hartford, well, yes. Pat Ritter. The wife, uh, I was teaching their daughter at the time. She was in the class. So we got a, a, an appointment with Katzenbach and Wizard White, both the Supreme Court person. We hit the jackpot that year. And so we were sitting there interviewing when the call came from Selma saying they're beating up the people and we need the National Guard right away. And you were sitting there yes. in the office yes. when the phone rang. Right. Can you imagine? And well, what did Kitsa what, what did he well, say? What well, we, they... when we realized, he immediately shut us off. We left after we had been there for a little while. We knew he was, in, he was busy. So we went out. But that night, F, um, Johnson declared the civil rights, his uh, declaration that uh, voting rights, you know, the, there were two problems that he uh, announced. The civil Rights Act of 64. Yes, that's the what it was. Act no, of 65. no, this is 64. Uh -huh. The voting rights, and so uh, it was. Uh, so that night we sat around the uh, television in the hotel and said, "Ah, there's this Wizard White from the Supreme Court. Oh, we know him. <laughs> you know, it was really fun." Wow! And then there was uh, moving ahead. I mean, you just keep on being in the right places. I during, was. During history. I was, right there, just by luck. While history was being made, 1968, the Democratic Convention in Chicago, you were a delegate? Yes. From Connecticut? Yes. And uh, uh, what was that? Who, who were you there to vote for as a delegate? Uh, well, Gene McCarthy, but we had been willing to go with Bobby Kennedy, who who came in after, if he looked the stronger, we were interested in getting out of Vietnam, and, and so that's what our group was. A lot, a lot of people were. Abraham Bukoff. Now he was the, at that time he was a senator. Yes, from he was. And he spoke at the convention, yeah. and you were there, right, right I near was, the microphone. I was. What did he say? What did he? What were his comments about the, the police outside? Well, he he was. Uh, he said, if McGovern were president, we would not have, the police, rioting, on the streets of Chicago, daily. When I went just ballistic. 1971, March, the Paris peace talks? Yeah. With the Vietnam War? Yes. Um, you were an election observer in, uh, in Nicaragua? Yes. In, the, in 1984? Yes. yes. Um, this, the, it was uh, the, San, the, San, uh, the Sandinistas, and... Um, they had won... Astoriega. Yes. Daniel. Oh, Daniel Ortega. Ortega was also involved. He was a Sandinista, right? Yes, he was. And how did that? Did, you were an election observer for the United States. Not, not by the United States. I belonged by that time to an organization called Sane, and had Sane. It was a Sane nuclear policy. But they changed their name to Peace Action. And it was that same, and then also there was the freeze, which meant free. By this time, we were 
worried about the ex arms race, nuclear arms race, which we didn't need to do. We had enough weapons, nuclear weapons, to wipe out the world. And to go on building and building more nuclear and on a hair trigger, it would look like too very dangerous. So we formed an organization called the Freeze. And uh, that was, uh, was another very important and still is organization that I still see my friends that I made in that time. And, uh, but anyway. Uh, did you see any signs as, a, as an election observer? Did you see well, any I wasn't evidence a, of, uh, of um, I was a, a volunteer. I, there was no elected observer, no election. We just said whoever wants to come. But we were given accreditation by the Nicaraguans to uh, to their uh, to observe their elections. And who won that? The Sandinistas won, didn't they? The Sandinistas, and they so they were the only. Central American group, uh, country. You know, Costa Rica is an exception too, but uh, the San the, the Nicaragua, which has backslid a bit, uh, but they won their election, and we were backing Somoza. Remember him? Yes. He, he was a uh, uh, he was a, a dictator that we backed as a country. Well, that's where the Iran-Contra. That's right. That's uh, absolutely that, that right. In there yeah, right. With uh, when Reagan was president. That's right. Uh, so the Bible and the in, cake. In your opinion, so having a, a, a front row seat to the proceedings, the Sandinistas were democratically elected the abs it was the fairest election you can imagine, but and yet, that's. But yet the American government did everything they could to undermine to, it, to undermine that, and to support the uh, the opposition, the Samosa. Samosa people. Why? Why? Why did we do that? Why did our country? We wanted. Uh, do that? It's, it's easier to control a dictator, particularly if you put them in power than to control a democratically elected. And Sandinista was considered a, that horrible word, a, a Marxist or a socialist. Yes, but they were, uh, we went, I went down to that area five times during the 80s and 90s. And um, it was so interesting uh, I, so I went to uh, Guatemala and, and uh, El Salvador and Nicaragua and Costa Rica and had a, a, a big chance to see what was happening in all of them. And talking to our ambassadors there, we always did that. And they was, I remember one, uh, I was met in Honduras, and I remember one ambassador, American ambassador to Honduras, and he was saying, you know, uh, they're a socialist country. Uh, and, and so I said to him, uh, but you can be a socialist in a democratic country too, can't you? thinking of Norway and of Denmark and so forth. And he said, yes, that's right, but it wouldn't be stable. Well, it wouldn't be stable because the United States wouldn't let them be stable. You know, it wasn't a... So, but we had that kind of thinking going on of what it was like to win a revolution but to be undermined. Mims, 
uh, you've been a Democrat all your life, and you haven't always agreed with everything that the party did. Um, what did the what? Tell us what the party stood for in 1940, and what seemed positive or negative to you then. Well, I'll tell you, I was involved in after the Abe Rubikoff, the 68 convention. We want because we'd had so much trouble with the arcane rules of getting involved. We started a, an organization within the Democratic Party called the Caucus of Connecticut Democrats. And I, at one time, was chairman of that. But there was some, a lot of people in New Haven, a good friend of mine that I made in Greenwich, and, but all around the state were part were part of that, and we, ha we uh, made up our own aims and were, uh, I'm sure, a thorn in the side of the regular Democratic Party. But anyway, we did work to, to correct, make it easier to uh, for the Democratic Party to be inclusive and more active in liberal causes. And uh, I think it may have been effective. Do you still see kind of the, today, the same sort of s split yes. in terms of the, the moderate Democrats who were more more uh, attached to the establishment and to the way things, you know, uh, yeah. to, the, uh, to the power structure and to people like Bernie Sanders? Do you see Yeah, a, a there's a real the difference. A difference there. Uh, there is, but uh, the reason I was stuck with the Democratic Party and it's so obviously easier to be actively involved and it is it has been up to this point uh, much more welcoming to other ideas than the, than the Republicans. Well, you taught high school. You taught college. What do you do? do you I never taught college. I was president of the college of uh, for one year, active year. Oh. But I was, I didn't teach. Okay, you were the president of what, what college? Uh, Hartford College for Women. Now combined with the University of Hartford. Well, so you've, you've spent a lot of yeah. your career in your right. life working with, do you, do you, do you, do you have any, um, do you regard young people today in a hopeful way, uh, you know, in terms of, their activism and their uh, political concern for for the society. Do you, yes, are you I or yeah. pessimistic about the young people. I have been to two high schools in West Hartford. The, the two high schools, Conard and Hall, to their AP classes, and talk to them about one of the projects that. Tim will bring you an example of. Uh, and they were so great. They were, I'm sure it had to do with their teachers too, but they would, they cared about what they were talking about. This is, and they argued with each other. It was so exciting. So I must say that I had some hope, a positive feeling about that. Well, I got to just finally yeah. wrap this up. I, and I, 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 I want to ask you on a personal question. I can't help but think about something you said way back at the beginning of where, that your mother was a staunch Republican. And given your evolution, your political consciousness, 
Was there a point, did you and your mother clash over that? Was there a lot of arguing, pushback? Was your mother... My mother, when I told her what went from college to, uh, to go home to vote, she asked me if I was registering for a party, and I said, yes, a Democrat. She burst into tears. And uh, she doesn't cry. She didn't cry easily. My mother burst into tears when I told her I was going to vote for, I was going to register as a Democrat. She said, what will my friends think? I thought, what a way to choose your friends. And my father persuaded me not to register as a party register as a voter, but not to choose a party, because I was getting married and going to move to Kent. Then he said, nobody will know that you're a Democrat. Well... <laughs> Was your father a Republican, too? No, I, I don't think so, but he never told him. He, he uh, never told us, my mother, how he was going to vote. That wasn't a... <laughs> Wow. Uh, but uh, so anyway, about 40 years later, I went back to the Shad Derby. Do you know the Windsor Shad Derby? They have once a year. And one of my husband's students had persuaded him to be a judge of the beauty contest, which was not up his alley. But anyway, uh, I had grown up there, I taught there, I, got to, I knew there must be somebody there that I would know. Sure enough, there was an old man named Mr. Ransom. So I went up to him. He was known as Mr. Republican when I was growing up. And I said, hello, Mr. Ransom, uh, I'm uh, Genevieve Brooks. A daughter, and he said, "Oh, you're the Democrat," and he turned his back on me and tottered off. Wow. So everybody in Windsor knew I was a de Democrat. All my mother's friends knew I was a Democrat. I was really very happy, and shows Mims very happy to have shared this half hour and the first half hour with those of you who are viewing this. Um, I hope you enjoyed it, her being on her journey with her, and we will um, see you for the next uh, for the next show with more really very interesting, fascinating guests. Thanks again for being with Jeff and Jeff's journey.